and a three. I buy too many Switch games, and I don't have time to play them all. Come on, guys, you know the words, sing along. I buy too many Switch games, and today I'm gonna talk about them all. I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna talk about some today with y'all. I'm gonna talk about some today with y'all. It doesn't work. It really does not work. Something I do very, very, very regularly on this channel is talk about eShop games. Try and give some love to those indies that don't get physical releases. But screw those today. We're talking about cold hard video games. Ones you can actually go into the store and buy. Reason being, there is so many games on Switch right now, I feel like it's confusing walking into a store, staring at a shelf of games and going, that one could be good, I don't friggin' know. So here's 10 that are good. You'll know for sure, next time you walk into a game store, that's the one. So yeah, here they all are, aren't they beautiful? Don't you wanna add these into your collection and then keep them sealed like I do for some frickin' reason? But how can you play them if they're sealed? Well, I get sent the codes to review them. So why do you buy them if you already have them? Because I have a problem! This what is this, my intervention? Let's not bring up my problem or I'll start bringing up yours, Jerry. Every Jerry watching this right now. <laughs> Today's sponsored Switch game stepping up to the plate to be featured in a video with nine other games. Vampire. Except not spelt like vampire, spelt with a Y. Why? Oh, you'll see. Well, you won't actually, because I don't talk about it, but if you play it, you'll see. I actually played Vampire on my Xbox One, back when it was released. Whenever the heck that was. I had had my eye on it because I was a huge fan of Don't Nod's Life is Strange series, and to be fair, Remember Me, which ironically is a game everyone has seemed to have forgotten about, was also really good. And I really enjoyed what I played of Vampire on the Xbox, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately really. I never played much on the Xbox, as playing Switch games typically dominates all of my gaming time, because I buy too many Switch games. But now, these two titans are merging, and I I finally get the chance to finish my playthrough portably on the Nintendo Switch. Vampire starts with a bang. You wake up clueless as to what's happened to you, surrounded by the dead as you probably once were. You stumble your way towards this figure. All you can see is her blood coursing through her veins and pumping away at her heart. And then everything goes horribly wrong from there and you set out on a path to figure out what the heck actually happened to you and what the heck you even are now. The game is set in London during the First World War. It's an open world game that features tons of unique characters, each with extensive dialogue trees, and here is the biggest hook to this game, and it's, uh, it's kind of messed up, man. <laughs> the more you talk to characters, learn about them, learn their secrets, or help them with their quests, the more you do all of that, it improves their blood quality. Then, at any point, you can mesmerize almost anyone in the game, any character, any NPC, and take them to a secluded area and feast on their blood. Killing them, obviously, and gaining experience experience depending on their blood quality. But now that they're dead, they, they won't be there anymore. Because that's, that's how <laughs> being dead works. So they can't help you, tell you new things, or even give you future quests. So without them, you now need to deal with the negative consequences of killing them. The whole concept ends up being everyone you talk to or help you are effectively preparing possible meals. And if you ever need a big hit of experience to level up, you can feast on one of your meals, and this is your own way of determining your own difficulty setting. Not killing anyone will come at a cost of not leveling up and getting stronger. So, can you control your thirst for blood? That would have been really funny if I had fangs. Hey Cam, this mechanic is super messed up, but it adds so much to the game both in decision making, the outcomes, replayability, and so on. The combat is really varied. You have one-handed melee weapons you can find or craft, like daggers or clubs. Your other hand can hold a wooden stake or a gun that helps you wound or stun enemies. Ultimately, more than anything, I need to show appreciation to the devs for really trying something different here. It's not often in an open world style game where you can literally kill all the characters, and the game is prepared for you to do that. But the idea of being able to groom your kills and gain strength from them Creating a balance between death and power is just brilliant. And I mean, I will always welcome a new open world game to this system. And this one has vampires. So, <laughs> I mean. This mask is really cool. I really love it. Hi, bro! Probably the only Nintendo Switch exclusive I haven't reviewed yet, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. It was released a few months ago now, it took me forever to actually play it, and by the time I did, the hype for the game of any kind had already died down. And here we are months later, and already no one's talking about this game anymore. So I won't either. <laughs>
<laughs> Just kidding, I'm gonna do it. I have a love-hate relationship with the previous two games in this franchise. They were pretty bare-bones basic beat-em-up video games. The fun was purely drawn from the amount of Marvel characters you could play as and imagining a world where they all came together and interacted in the weirdest of mix-ups imaginable. You gotta remember, this was before the Marvel movies, so this was a dream come true for a comic book nerd like myself. Not this one, the previous two. Y you know what I'm talking about. But the gameplay was average, having to traverse linear paths, hallways, and still rooms, and smash one or two attack buttons on repeat with a boss battle at the end and then a cutscene. The most fun I had in these games was playing them with friends at sleepovers with Mountain Dew between my legs and pack a Dorito stuffed under my arm. I miss those days. Seeing the third game announced blew my freaking mind as it was a series of games I assumed was long dead and a Nintendo Switch exclusive of all things. I was very curious to see how they would shake up the formula to make the third game feel fresh. And uh, they, they didn't at all. It's the exact same game. But with a shiny new coat of paint, arguably better heroes this time around and overall a much better polished adventure. Don't get me wrong. This is the best game in the series for sure. And for fans, and Marvel, either the comic books or the movies, there is so much fun to be had here. The combat's still pretty basic, but all the levels are so fast paced and short enough that they don't really drag on. The cutscenes are the most improved thing about the game, they feel like they're straight out of the Marvel movies, maybe with a more cartoon TV show feel about it. The story is actually interesting this time, while still kind of forgettable. And what I love the most is that characters like Guardians of the Galaxy feel like they're movie counterparts, while characters like Wolverine are straight out the comic books. And then Spider-Man is voiced by the same guy who voiced the PlayStation 4 Spider-Man game. So it feels like that specific Spider-Man has joined the roster. So this really is the ultimate Marvel crossover. Move over Endgame. Ah, I tried to catch that because I regretted throwing it. Next, if I was Spider-Man with Spidey rah, reflex Spidey sense tingling, I would have caught it. Guess I just proved that I'm not Spider-Man. <laughs> I'm Wolverine, baby. Uh, this one's next. Mutant Year Zero. What do, you, what do you want from me? Better introduction? <laughs> Please. In Mutant Year Zero, you play as a duck man thing and a pig man thing. That's all the time I have, guys. All right, see ya, bye. I love you. <laughs> As the title would suggest, they're probably mutants. And not the cool ones, like in the Marvel Ultimate game we just talked about. Nah, no, the ugly kind of mutants. Like your mama. <laughs> Sorry. What this game does best is splice up the tactical turn-based combat genre that I love with exploration and adventure, allowing you to explore a world around the fights and in the case of Mutant Year Zero, struggle for survival as you search the world for scrap to trade or enemies to get the jump on. I really enjoyed the excellent voice acting throughout the game. Everything about Mutant Year feels like I'm playing AMC's The Walking Dead Come to Life, but with no zombies and instead a duck man. What I love the absolute most in this game is stumbling upon a group of enemies and the choices between sneaking past them or silently taking out as many as you can or finding a good vantage point before ambushing them and triggering combat. Typically in these kind of games you have your starting position thrust upon you when the battle begins and you kind of just have to work with that. The enemies will typically react the same way at the start of each battle and it never really feels organic. But Mutant Year gives you the option of starting the battles your way. But to counteract that freedom, you better not screw up or leave yourself open. It won't treat you as a bullet sponge. If you get shot, you're going down. So use that freedom to your advantage and figure out the best strategies to stay alive. And once you pull that trigger to initiate a fight, yeah, you better be ready for it. This game is brutally tough, which does make the victories that much more rewarding, but it also makes restarting a battle for the 20th time that much more frustrating. Next, we have Kill La Kill, the game, if? I'm not sure if it's if or if, I think it's if, but it, it looks like if. So I gotta be honest, I've never heard of Kill La Kill before this game was released, and I still haven't watched the anime. That's a lie, actually. I wrote this before last night, and last night, Kim and I sat down and watched the first two episodes. Pretty, it's pretty good. I decided to pick it up and play it regardless of not having seen the anime before for two reasons. One, I actually really enjoyed My Hero's One's Justice, a fighter done in this same style based on the My Hero Academia anime. And the other reason was that it had a shiny little label down here for Arc System Works, the same developer that made Dragon Ball Fighters, another anime based fighter that was freaking awesome. Now, I didn't realize at that time that Arc had only published Kill la Kill where they actually developed Dragon Ball Fighters, so it's not made by the same people. 
technically. But hey, that's still a good sign, right? Obviously, or else we wouldn't be talking about it. Taking a leaf from Dragon Ball Fighter's book, these character models, while technically being 3D models, they look more like they're straight out of the anime in a more 2D hand-drawn style, and I love that. Coupled by the animated cutscenes by the original cast, and voice acting from the original cast, you really have a fantastic effort here in bringing the show to life in a video game. Sadly, the roster is tiny, but each character does play very differently, which helps. And I really, really enjoy the gameplay. It's just satisfying to play or watch someone play. Even when you're just mashing buttons, it somehow ends up looking like a fight straight out of the anime. The way the combat blends in with the story is seamless and organic, the controls are fluid, it's easy to learn and rewarding to master. If you're a fan of the anime, this must be a very exciting surprise. If you're not a fan, it's probably more of a wait for sale scenario, especially with the tiny roster. But all I can say is, just like with my hero, I was pleasantly surprised once again. Uh, uh, uh. I honestly love all of the games on this list today, and as I sat down to write this video, the words of which you can see here, and if there was ever a game to slightly breeze over, it's probably one that we all already know is near perfection. Nino Kuni. Speaking of animes come to life, Nino Kuni's artwork was greatly inspired by Studio Ghibli, and the animated sequences were in fact produced by Studio Ghibli. These cutscenes are wonderful, magical, and just so wholesome. Nino Kuni honestly feels right at home on the Switch. There are elements to it that even feel like Pokemon, such as collecting these adorable familiars which help fight for you. There's quite a bit going on here with the gameplay between controlling both yourself and your familiars in combat. I haven't really played an RPG quite quite like this one, it's so fresh and original even now in 2019. Easily a must play game, not even a must play RPG, which it is, it's just a must play game in general. One thing to look out for is at the same time this game released on Switch, a remastered version released on PlayStation 4. This is not the remastered version, it's just a straight port from PlayStation 3, nothing's been upgraded or made to look better or be different. It's just portable now. And I personally have no issue with that. Of course, it's kind of a catch-22 thing. But considering this game still looks fantastic on the Switch, and you can take a portable, that's a huge advantage over improved visuals overall. But I mean, that's just my opinion. And who cares about that? I mean, I don't like Xenoblade 2, so... <laughs> Oh, that felt great! Knocking out a game that quickly? Where else can I shave off some minutes on this video? Oh, I know! How about these three games? Forager, Wargroove, and Enter the Gungeon. Let's just do them all at once. <laughs> Why not? As you guys know, one of my favorite things to do is scour the eShop looking for little hidden gems and highlighting them in videos just like this one. And you can watch those videos right here. It's like a whole playlist of them. 18 now. Yeah, boy. And sometimes games from those lists end up getting physical releases months later. Typically if they end up selling pretty well. Which, I, I would like to think that we all played a part in making happen, even though it's a thankless job. No one's ever thanked me for one of their games selling well. I mean, did they thank you guys? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't see the letter in the mail. <laughs> the best part is, when they release the games physically, they usually have tons of extra stuff. Like, Wargroove is the deluxe edition. It has a strategy manual, soundtrack, map, and stickers. Enter the Gungeon has all the DLC, which is a lot, and a download code for the soundtrack. And Forager has... some... Stickers? <laughs> yeah, and a poster, to be fair. And maybe there's a video to be made on some of these little indie gems that end up getting physical releases once I've already talked about them, but for now, here's these three. Three brilliant games that if you saw me review these, but you don't like buying digital-only games and thought, dang it, even if they had a freaking physical re dang it, if only it had a physical release. Well, yeah, now they do. I wanted to alert everyone that now they have gone and done did that. And if you want to watch me actually review these three games, there'll be links down below, you can probably link at the end of the video, you can probably click this little thing that nobody ever actually uses on YouTube. And is it cheap of me to bundle three games into one slot in a video that was supposed to be a list of ten games? Yes. It's my video though, so moving on. <laughs> Killer Queen Black has been a confusing ride for me. I had never heard of this game before, and then like, what, a, a year ago, two maybe? It was announced for Switch and many people cried out in glee. Finally, they said, finally Killer Queen's coming to Switch. I, I, I just didn't, 
I didn't get it. Is this like a Mandela effect? Am I from a reality where this game wasn't actually a thing? Super confused. I watched all the trailers and some gameplay, and now I'm the last person to judge a book by its cover. But I, but, 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 but I just didn't see it. I, I didn't get it. Months, years, decades went by, and now it's finally dropped on Switch with a physical version to boot. And it's good. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's really good. I mean, personally, I, I still don't totally get it, but it's insanely fun. Eight player competitive online multiplayer aspect alone is well worth checking out. The matches are played on a single screen. You can win by either achieving economic, military, or snail victory. The workers can gather berries for an economic victory or ride a snail to the finish line, or you can kill the enemy queen three times and win that way. You can also power up your workers to become fighters to help take down the queen, but then the workers can't help gather berries or ride the snail. So that's where a load of strategy comes into play and each match ends up feeling completely different. Visually, this game reminds me of a lot of games I'd used to play way back when on my MS-DOS, like Commander Keen. And while I love that game, that's not a comparison any video game wants, I don't think. <laughs> there is nothing at all exciting about the way this game looks, but that really does speak volumes for how fun the base gameplay is. Speaking of the good old days, the eight player multiplayer mode would have been a hit at my friend's game nights after high school. Kind of a shame we didn't have it back then. Ah, too late now. For me, not for you. You might have your whole life ahead of you. I'm old. I'm, my back hurts. I'm 29. One foot in the grave. It's all over for me now. <laughs> You know, I really wanted to do an entire video on Witcher 3 Wild Hunt because I feel like the game deserves it. But there are so many games that keep releasing, I honestly can't keep up. I don't have massively positive things to say about Witcher 3 on Switch specifically. I'll start by saying just the fact that it's on Switch is frigging insane. Just the fact that I can play this game, Witcher 3, on this itsy bitsy little thing, it's freaking hilarious more than anything. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, the Switch Lite's probably the best way to play this game on the tiny screen. Docked, the game kind of looks like someone dug their hand in mud, threw it at your TV and said, try playing The Witcher 3 now. The lighting, assets, character models, everything has been downscaled so much that they've all turned into a muddy, blurry mess. And on a big TV, it all kind of blends together into an arguably beautiful oil painting. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm over-exaggerating a little bit, but for the lols, after playing it on Switch for a few hours, I booted up my Xbox One X and I restarted a game and, and immediately I was picking up on details, characters, even full buildings that I missed on the Switch version because they were just unrecognizable as I was riding past on Roach. And that's an unfair comparison for sure. But when it comes to my Switch ports, I personally need to feel like I'm not missing out on too much by playing it on Switch. And Witcher 3 has such a beautiful, rich world to explore, I really feel like I'm missing out on that playing the Switch version. But the visuals aren't the only thing that make Witcher 3 fantastic. The Witcher is one of the greatest games of all freaking time. The story and its decision making, the combat, the deep RPG mechanics, exploration, all of that makes for a game that I personally much prefer over any other game in this genre. And as I said, portably or on the Switch Lite on the smaller screen, it's a lot easier to notice those little details. And again, how? How is The Witcher 3 on Switch? Just the fact that they pulled this off and it runs really well is a miracle. If you haven't played this game before, it's 100% worth picking up on the Switch. Yeah, and sticking to portable mode. Just because this game is so damn incredible, and if this is the only way you have to play it, then it will freaking do. Personally, for me, all this Switch version has done is made me reinstall it on my Xbox to play through it one more time. But that does not mean that this version isn't worth it. It still, it still absolutely is. Thus, I wouldn't be talking about it. Get it, buy it, play it. Especially if this is your only way of doing so. I mean, it has all the DLC. What more would you want? You won't be able to see all that DLC, but you know. Hey, look at us! We made it through another video together. I'm so proud of you, and you, and I'm also proud of you. You didn't do that great. Whatever. Uh, a huge thank you to Vampire again for sponsoring the video. Please, if there is any game in this list today that you consider buying, consider that game being Vampire. It would really help me out if you click the link for the game in the description before you leave here today. Just simply clicking on it and showing some interest, it, it makes me look good. I mean, buying it makes me look even better, but I won't force you to do that. <laughs> but you should, because I said so. <laughs> Before you leave, like the video, hit a flip on that subscribe button. Probably... <clears throat>